partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Marcus with Sean Hackett. This edition of the Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by Axon mm -hmm. Tire, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. For more information, go to axontire.com. Axon Tire has a couple great gifts they like to give away. They have a flashlight and a ball cap. If you want one of those, send an email to marketing at axontire.com, and they'll send that to you as fast as they possibly can in the mail to your house quickly. That way, Sean, when you're down on that, that hot Florida sun, you can get that hat on, and then at nighttime, you can see where you're going. So everything everything works out for you. Perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. Should, should it'll, be. Go, it'll, it'll go along with my cat mug. So. That will be, and that'll, that'll be nice accessories for you there sean for your outfit <laughs> but good all right valley transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years call parker at 800-657-4910 for your trucking needs at valley transportation our goal is to help you reach yours powered by farm credit ag direct is built for today's agriculture with simple applications quick responses competitive rates and generous flexible terms ag directs offer buy lease and refinance options for almost all types of new and used equipment, non-recourse and timely funding back to the dealership plus sales incentives. No other ag equipment lender like works like AgDirect. Learn more by calling your AgDirect territory manager at 888-525-9805 or visit us at agdirect.com. TractorZoom has access to over $20 billion in heavy equipment sales data. TractorZoom's Iron Comps is the industry's trusted solution for transparent equipment values and auctionable pricing insights. This podcast is also brought to you by Anvil AppWorks. The Dealer Connect CRMI app. With integrated inventory management, it's an affordable Salesforce-based solution for your dealership. Create connected customer experience and transform how you work today. This podcast is also brought to you by Iron Solutions, powered by Randall Riley. I have Sean Hackett here with me from Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida. And he's cool enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the marketplace. So, Sean, how you doing, man? I'm doing good, Casey. Real good. It is a... Uh, Best way to put it, I guess, you know, Sean, you and I have been doing this since 2018-ish, I think, something like that. And yeah. the cool thing about this, Sean, is that no matter what happens uh, in that time frame, we've never had a period of time where we looked at each other via Zoom here and said, I don't know what we're going to talk about, Sean. There's just not much happening. This is a, a very odd time. Uh, right now, as you look and see what happened with the news, you got the bank stuff. We know we've, everyone's beat that to death and you see that. But I think, so I was on a podcast today and I'd love your, your, your response to this, kind of get your opinion on this. And I was recording one and, and uh, one of the things that they brought up about this uh, Ukrainian um, grain corridor and what that in the Black Sea deal was that the reason it was 90 days was because there's an election coming up in Turkey and Erdogan is up for re-election and the idea that he's not the most popular fellow in Turkey right now, um, comparatively to who he's running against, um, with him being buddy buddies with with Putin the way he is, this next person coming in could just autom automatically come and just shut everything down and and say, you know, we're not we're not going to be involved with this anymore. You thought about that at all? And and do you have an opinion on that? I actually haven't thought about it. Um, I just have a, I've had the view that um, 
because of China's uh, interests in wanting to keep food flowing from Russia to them, that they wanted this corridor deal to remain open. And given that it seems to me that Russia really is, you know, remember that one of their ways of raising capital, which is with selling crude oil, crude oil has dropped 50% uh, in the last six months. You know, their ability to raise capital from selling crude is not very good right now. So I think that they're very, very uh, dependent on China for capital to keep the war effort going. And uh, so I think China pretty much told them, keep it open um, if you want our support. And I don't think they have a choice in the matter, quite frankly. That's how I do the whole thing. Makes sense. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm not saying the Erdogan connection is 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 not a, a worthy consideration. I just I just think the China relationship is more important. But you know, I I, I don't know enough about the Turkish situation to say I have anything smart to say. So yeah, that makes. I think the China squeeze probably has a little more, a little more because they're. I mean, not only is China buying grain from them, they're buying a, a heck of a lot of oil too. So they are. That's they are. And remember, at sixty five dollars a barrel, they're going to buy a whole lot more to give them the same amount of capital that they were selling at 110 or 120. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I just, you know, I just think that when, when that white paper came out and they made, and China made those comments and um, it, it pretty much said this great corridor deal is going to remain open so long as China wants it to stay open and Russia is going to do what we tell them to do. That's what I read from the white paper yeah. and the market took it as such. And maybe if you looked at the price of corn and wheat, they started selling off that 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 second, and then and you know and up until just recently they've been selling off ever since. Yeah. So that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right. So let, let's spend a little time talking about some of the stuff going on on in the soft market side. We haven't talked about that for a while. So I mean, you look at stuff like um, I know I know dairy is not necessarily a a soft market, but as you're looking at at the dairy picture right now the dairy producer right now is struggling to make any money at all i mean they're they're milking for free right now i guess so looking at that market sean as you're as you're looking forward into the next quarter here hopefully some of this chinese demand for milk powder and those kind of things start to start to creep up i guess looking at that sean what are your thoughts on the dairy market well we we warned all our dairy customers who subscribe to our dairy report you know to get fully hedged here in the, in the first quarter like 100 percent priced and protected and we suggested that they got get at least 50% to 75% hedge in the second quarter because we were worried about a demand, um, you know, air pocket from China. Um, and that's exactly what's happened. And, and there's no one in the world that's can make money producing uh, milk. That's the bad news, but that's already happened. We're already there. Um, the few things that we, that are tend to give us a really good lead indicator to the future, or one of the really important indicators is the price of cattle to the price of milk. When the price of cattle is high relative to the price of milk, we get aggressive culling of dairy cows. Um, and then you get a shrinking of the dairy herd. And that's always a leading indicator to a significant reduction in production of milk globally and in the U.S. So if we look at the U.S. cull rates, I believe they're setting records right now in terms of how quickly farmers are selling. Because remember, that's how they, they can raise capital, right? You sell, you sell your less productive dairy cows and you, and you sell them at record high prices and you bring all kinds of capital in, which helps you know, kick the can down the road on these poor prices. And of course, no one is, is wanting to expand. So it, the, the herd is shrinking now. Now it doesn't have, it's not an immediate effect to production, it, it, but back, bottom line is back half of the year, we're going to see US production and the production everywhere else start to decline. And if, even if China's rebound out, off of COVID is just in the moderate category, Casey, let's say they're just, they're just, they have a moderate successful rebound, um, the demand for dairy later this year is going to be significantly up from where it is today. So if you look at the two combination, weaker production, China demand improving, it says that the low in prices globally and in the U.S. should be right about now. I think we can kind of like crawl our way out of the hole in the second quarter, you know, two steps forward, one step back. And then I think it really gets some exciting uh, trends in the summer and the fall. That's been our, our forecast for quite some time. And I don't see anything yet that would suggest uh, otherwise. So. Right on. Okay. 
looking at stuff, let's talk about sugar for a minute. So sugar has kind of stayed the same. I haven't really seen much movement there. Um, you'll see like a penny or two one way or the other, but it's probably well stayed the same. Looking at um, going into sugar beet plain season here, coming up not too not too very far from here, about 30 days or so. Um, as you look at the sugar market, Sean, what do you think there? Well, sugar, if you look at the price of sugar, has been sideways in a trading range for about two and a half years. You know, it just hasn't done anything. It had a big move from 2020 to, you know, 21, and then it just hasn't done anything. Uh, but El Nino, El Nino, El Nino, and El Nino. Uh, that's really what drives the sugar market higher in the past, is that you, if El Nino was coming, which it is, Asia gets into big, 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 big trouble from production. The two countries that really, really dominate and really matter is India and Thailand. So... You know, we believe we're going to have um, a developing hot, dry weather pattern this growing season, and it will parlay into a second year uh, of difficulty in 24 as the El Nino really uh, you know, reaches maturity. And so and that means sugar production in Asia is going to be on, in a world of hurry. And, and China also tends to have some significant sugar production problems as well. So when I look at that, when I look at a situation where we have, let's say, a, a very balanced market, you know, supply and demand is fairly balanced, and we're going to go into a significant downturn in Asian sugar production over the next um, 12 to 18 months, you know, I would expect that this sideways trading pattern is eventually going to break out to the upside and offer um, a repricing based upon weather problems in Asia. Um, so I think it's an interesting market. Sugar tends to uh, act in a, uh, differently than grains because of the differences in the weather pattern. And there's also a wedge pattern, a, a seven-year wedge pattern, Casey, that uh, if you draw the lines, we, go to the, we get to the end of the cone by the end of the second quarter of this year. And anyone that knows these, these long sideways uh, consolidation wedge patterns knows that when you get to the end of the cone, you typically get a a price volatility expansion event in either direction, up or down. Obviously, uh, it's up to me to, to try to determine what's more probable. And obviously with El Nino, my speculation is as we get to the end of the cone, we're going to see an upside breakout of that pattern. And those patterns have to, do tend to be pretty um, impulsive and explosive at times. So, you know, what we're telling our uh, physical buyers of sugar that we work with you know, that we would definitely be wanting to have a lot of upside protection to the upside by the end of the second quarter uh, ahead of this El Nino weather pattern because, um, you know, sugar prices do tend to be a fast mover when they get going. And I don't think that uh, one would want to be, uh, you know, uh, w w I, I don't, I, I think that the, if you're a risk manager, you want to hedge your risk in the direction that mother nature tells you to El Nino tells you hedge upside price risks at this point so i think the sugar market you know is is is, is an interesting market this year and could be one uh that many will, will talk about as one of the better performers to the upside this year especially after the second quarter um is what i'm thinking here so. right on so let's let's hit let's hit the the bean oil market here a little bit and, and what we see happening there. I mean, that's, we've talked about that pretty extensively, but you take a look at palm oil and, and different oils, uh, soybean meal and, and those kind of things from around the world right now. Um, as you look at that market, Sean, especially the, the palm oil market, how, how much that drives the oil markets that we see out there. When you're looking at that with what we see happening right now, geopolitically in the world, how's that influencing that marketplace? Well, you know, I mean, typically vegetable oils were always used for food, right? Almost everything you buy in the store has some kind of vegetable oil in it, whether it's canola oil, whether it's uh, bean oil, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever, you know, it, it's, but then we decided that we wanted to use it for fuel. And so we started making biodiesel, which is, uh, uh, you know, and then, and then now we're to, it, it, wanting to get into what's called renewable diesel, which is re really creating actual diesel out of vegetable oil yeah and so what that did was it took a, a a some chunk of this vegetable oil supply and took it off the market for food and said we're going to use this for energy 
And that's really tightened the market up on that. We had a big, big rally in vegetable oil, you know, um, because of that. The problem uh, now is that, you know, crude oil is crashing and is yet the bottom. I mean, we're at 60, we hit 65, I think, or earlier this week. And I think we're at 68, 69 right now. But I mean, <clears throat> remember, uh, a renewable diesel uh, plant is only going to operate if it can operate profitably. Yeah. So what you have to do is you just have to take the price of bean oil or canola oil or, or, or uh, palm oil, whatever oil you're using, plus the subsidy the government's giving you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, plus the price you can sell renewable diesel for and you say, okay, can I make money? Well, not, not forever. <laughs> you know, if the crude oil price continues to fall much lower, you start running into a problem where even with the government subsidies, you're not really able to make a profit. We've seen this in ethanol too, by the way, you know, that, you know, at some point the ethanol price is just not attractive, even with a government subsidy. So obviously, you know, Cordell had a 10% crash this past week on the banking crisis, Casey, you know, we're worried about the economy and all. So that needs to stop going down um, or else a lot of these plants are going to uh, struggle to understand why they should be operating if they can't generate a profit. I mean, I mean, if we get down to $50 a barrel oil, I don't think they can make any money. Yeah. And it still comes down to making money. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, so, um, uh, all the trends would say, so long as crude oil remains, I say 65 or better, I kind of really feel that's the line then we should see a lot of demand. We should see higher prices, but we do need to stop this crude oil market from falling. Not we, I mean, the crude oil market needs to dig its heels in here at 65, Casey. If it starts to fall below then, then, then one has to back away from a lot of in, in, in these projections and, 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 and try to figure out what's really gonna happen here, you know, because you're not gonna operate plants unprofitably. Right. Um, maybe somebody will for a little while, but 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 it's it's you can't force someone to operate at a loss. So I don't know. You know, it's we're we're at a moment where where things need to turn in the crude oil market. I'm not saying they're you know I'm not an expert on crude oil. I mean I I don't I don't have an edge in crude oil, it's such an international market. But um, I'm kind of surprised it's come down this low. <laughs> I would have thought it would have. Um, Held up a little bit better, but it just seems this banking crisis, you know, really, really, you know, took another shot down on this, and um, we'll have to see. You know, I, I don't know what else to say other than you know there there is a tie to crude oil and diesel prices, and it needs to stop. And I, I think it will, but obviously, you know, we're we're you know the driving season and all, but I mean, we really obviously. One of the things, Casey, that we need to be looking for is remember that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve has been drawn down significantly. I think it's been drawn down three quarters. Um, and the Biden administration claimed that it would begin buying essentially under $70. Um, I think if they start buying to refill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, that's how you, that's how you put the low in. I mean, the minute that the market sees that they're doing that, and like you know, buy 50, 60, 80 million barrels of oil that you know, you know, but they we haven't we haven't seen that yet. We haven't heard anything about them buying SPR back. Yeah, that's what I have I remember them saying that when it gets below 70, we're gonna go back and fill back. We out. haven't heard anything yet. We've been that's if they put out a, a press release that says, Hey, we're gonna buy hundred million barrels. I think they they've drawn down five hundred million barrels of oil. So if they say hey, we're gonna buy hundred million barrels of oil back now. That's how you get your bottom in the market right now because of all the fear that's out there with the banking sector and the economy and everything. And I, you know, I'm not, I can't speak on buying the administration's behalf, but I, uh, I think they should be buying it back. I don't think we want our Chief Patrol Reserve to be as low as it is. And I think we, hey, look, they made a heck of a trade. Let, let, let's let's give credit to where credit is due. You think of all that crude oil they sold <laughs> at 120 and 115 and 110. And they can buy it all back under 70. Let's say they're able to do that. I mean, what a, it's a heck of a trade, Casey. I mean, they won. I mean, yeah, they, they made a heck of a trade. But it's only, it's only a great trade if they, buy the, if they buy the physical back, right? 
So whether that was just dumb luck or not, they have an opportunity to put it back. So I, uh, I'd be looking for that to me. I'd be looking for that as a, as a really important um, fundamental marker to put a bond in this market and to get the market going the other way again. Yeah. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I think the, uh, what's the best, what's the best way for me to say this without saying it? It definitely wasn't dumb. Let's put it that way. <laughs> we'll see if it was luck or not, I guess. <laughs> All I know is it's turned out to be one heck of a good call on their part. Oh, sure. However, even if it was just dumb luck, um, hats off to them. Uh, I, 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 if you run the numbers, I think they could want to make in maybe 50 or 20 billion on the trade if they're, if they're able to buy it back. Um, down here so you know i would imagine they're going to i if they if they're going to if they're going to do what they said eventually they're going to do it and so the second that happens and they say we're a buyer now i then that's to me that's it but the markets markets you know what the market's doing it's it's calling them on it's calling them out you said you were going to do it right now do it prove, yeah. Pro yeah. prove it right and all, or all, right now, all, all that, that they've heard back from them is crickets. Right. So, you know what the market's going to do? It's going to keep down, putting it down and pressing it until they go, okay, 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 we're going to buy it now. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what the market's doing. It's calling them on the carpet saying, you said, show me. If not, we're, we're making a lot of money going short the crude oil market right now, and we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. They, and they... Prove, prove me that you're going to go buy all this oil back. So, they have a, uh, a pretty good short position. I think I think they're doing okay there. <laughs> no, I just but it's just an interesting dynamic that yeah. you know they you know they, you can say all you want, but are you actually going to do it? <laughs> right. Exactly right. Uh, uh, the other thing I think is interesting this week. Uh, hog market limit down yesterday, across the board, or you know multiple contracts limit down. I was like four seventy five is limit now, or four fifty or something like that. Um, African swine fever is raging again in China. Um, no, it's not, Sean. That's a lie. <laughs> we actually talked about it on your on your show, oh, I think, a week ago or two weeks yeah. ago. But 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 it it it's you no know, Reuters came out with a big splash, uh, not uh, not last night, but the night before, and um. And uh, it's it seems to be getting out of control again, and um, the hog price in China, the nearby hog price, has crashed, completely crashed because of everyone trying to sell their animals before they can't sell them. Because if you have yeah. a pig that has a disease, you can't get anything for it. And um, now the deferred hog price, I mean the hog prices out into the fall have been rising because you would you know, we've been through this twice now. We've been through this. You get a massive near-term oversupply, and then you have a massive shortage six months later mm -hmm. when you run through the supply, and everybody says, "Oh shit, we got to get those, we got to rebuild the herd again." All right. So, and and it, and it, and it's been it's been percolating. We talked about it on your show actually a week ago, I think it was. Um, but it really it's 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 starting to. It, in the beginning, it was like okay, there's a little bit of an issue, but it, it does look like it's becoming a major problem again, like a you know. The numbers that I am starting to hear from people that know more about it than I do are starting to show numbers are getting really, really big. And um, like so, 20 numbers like that? Not, not quite as big as that. No, I would say uh, uh, no, and, and not as big. Well, we don't, it, it's, it's, we're not done with it yet. It's still in progress. But as of right now, not as bad as that. But I would say maybe 50% uh, as bad as that, which is really bad, by, by the way. Yeah, it's... Right now they're talking about something like 10 to 15% reduction in hog numbers and potential production, which for the largest producer of pork in the world is a large number a, um, to be talking about. And, 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 and we're not done yet. It, it, that's what we know today. But the hog market just got obliterated yesterday. And um, there's going to be you know, we've, we've, play, we've played this record twice, Casey. This is the third record. And we know that it's devastating in the short run to price, but it's also a uh, boomerang uh, to prices six months hence. So, you know, uh, there's, there's going to be an opportunity in this 
for buyers of pork and for buyers of hogs and that sort of thing when the panic calms down here i don't i don't know what's going to happen today we'll be limited down again today we could be um but um but when the dust settles you know there's going to be a great opportunity for those on the physical buy side of this market to get some really good coverage uh, because you know they're going to go into their next holiday season coming out of covid i might add yeah with no supply and needing all kinds of pork to be brought into the country. Of course, the U.S. would be a large recipient of large orders from the Chinese. Timing exactly when they're going to buy, you know, they could buy before they need it, you know, hard to say. But I think yesterday's crash and, and how much, how much, how much, whatever remains left in the crash is, is, is going to offer, you know, because we know this is not a forever deal. You liquidate the herd really, really fast and you dump all this pork on the market and it, and it ends and then you got to go the other way so so there's a there's a big opportunity there in what's just starting to develop here into something much more serious than just a a, a, a isolated um situation with asf this is becoming a, another major market moving event for the hog market so yeah. i would definitely be keeping the hog market on one's radar screen especially if you're in the business if you're a producer you know selling into the hole is not typically what you're supposed to do um you know if you're not protected enough to the downside if you're not fully hedged to the downside you know i, I don't i'm not sure there's much you can do right now after you know if you haven't done anything to this point it's almost kind of like too late to do it too much mm -hmm. but um uh, hopefully you've done enough hedging as a, as a hawk producer you've done enough protecting and you're and you can get through this this value of the shadow of death I, that I call it. Because remember, pork prices relative to beef prices are at a historic discount. We're going into the grilling season. I think demand's going to be better. You know, and I, and I don't think, you know, it, it's one time when you go through an ASF for the very first time, like we did in 2019, I guess it was. This is, we, we, we know the playbook. So I, I, I think this is going to be a, you know, I don't think it's going to be a long lasting effect. I think it could be, you know, one to two months of it. And then we come screaming out of it. You know what I'm saying? Mm. But uh, so if I'm a producer, don't panic. If I'm a a buyer, a physical buyer, you know, I would be ready to load up my physical needs um, when it looks like we're 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 done with the uh, with the uh, with the panic trade here. And, and so today will be very tough. It's a Friday. We had a limit down yesterday. We have expanded limits today. It'd be very telling to see how bared up the market really is on this um or not no way to tell but you know if we had one more big down day today uh, if i'm you know if you look at a chart on the uh, you know chart support on the june or that sort of thing one more limit down day would kind of get us to some really important long-term support you know that might be a spot to take a stab if you're a physical buyer you know this is just what we're eyeballing and talking to our customers with overnight is kind of eyeballing maybe one more you know limit down move or something like that just just a dynamic moment for the hog market and something really smart could be done here to the buy side i think uh depending how far they want to take it so good time sean <laughs> what i'm talking about right there all right <laughs> well what, what we know about african swine fever is once you get it you it never goes away like you're always battling it for for everyone who's ever gotten it they still have it like it's just you have you're just always in a managing flux and uh, china is just having another flux the problem is when they flux they have so many yeah. <laughs> hogs that every time they flux it's a big problem yeah um and because they even though they got rid of a lot of their backyard uh producers the last go around they still have a lot and yeah. uh you know it's easy to manage an outfit if you have you know a million pigs on your you know in one well you can you can contain it but when you still have thirty thousand. Uh, backyard producers that have 10 pigs or less quality control is difficult it does make it hard it's it you know where's that eighth pig where did you go you know what are you gonna do yeah exactly <laughs> we had eight pigs now we're down to seven yeah Gosh. we need to know where it went i mean it's just it's it's, a, it's an impossible task casey it's impossible yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not blaming the chinese it's, it, they just need to get down to these to big corporate producers mm -hmm. that have you know big amounts where they can manage it you know do yep. biometrics and all this stuff and containment and they're they're getting there but they're not quite there yet and, and this is going to be another another round of 
getting rid of those smaller guys because smaller guys can't survive these these episodes. They just go under, you know, unfortunately. So all right, Sean Hackett with the highlight, the good news of the day. Well, it was a big mover yesterday. You know, you don't see the the you don't see the hog market limit down on what is it, four or five contracts out very often. Uh right. so uh, you know. Definitely uh, something to pay attention to. Happy so, Friday. I'm just, happy that's Friday, what we're going to call this one. Happy Friday. <laughs> well, All if right. you're a buyer of pigs, you're, this is a very exciting moment for you. Very, that's very the, positive. Yeah. I mean, this is, you couldn't ask for, I mean, this is very, you know, there's two sides to the market for the buyer. This is, this is heaven on earth. All right. So, you know, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm, I'm, I, I uh, have a soft spot for the producer, as you know. Yeah, and it's not good for the producer, but for the buyer, I mean, this is a, just a, another tremendous uh, opportunity. Yeah, so. for sure. All right, Sean, good stuff as usual. Folks can reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing over at Hacker Financial. What's the best way to do that? Uh, you can check our Twitter page at, at Faradex11, our, our LinkedIn page, Sean Hackett or Hacker Financial Advisors. You can search or our website at Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T advisors.com we from time to time post interviews with you and others that kind of go over some of our weather cycles and some of our other metrics and capital flow tools that we utilize that help make our recommendations to our farmers producers and end users to try to bring more money home on the farm right on so elon let you back on huh (laughs) (laughs) yes yes he he, uh he, he said uh he said that uh, because of my recommendation, he he stocked up his um, his at uh, his hundred uh, the one hundred yachts he has yeah. with beef. Oh, there you go. And it's been a really yeah. it's been really helpful to him, and so he was very excited about that. Mm-hmm. So because of that, he said he let me back on the uh, back on his platform for now. That's good. He, he, just like better, you... I, he just he just said I better not you know steer him wrong on the recommendation. You might get that blue check mark now with this with the whole hog <laughs> thing. You know what I mean? So you're gonna be good now. Yeah. Well, if he's if he likes pork, he might be able to fill up his uh, freezers with pork now. So hopefully he's uh, he does that as well. And I can stand for a, I, I can have a I can have my my extension renewed. There you go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right on, man. Well, Sean, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Thank, as, thanks always, Casey. Appreciate it. Right on, man. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC, LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast, and check out the YouTube channel over on YouTube at Moving Iron LLC, or sorry, Moving Iron Podcast over there. So if you want information about the Moving Iron Summit coming up here in Nashville, Tennessee, September 11th through the 13th, go to the Moving Iron LLC website, which is movingironllc.com, and check the upper right hand corner. Click on the Moving Iron Summit tab. And you get all the information there. If you're one of the first 150 people to sign up, Axon takes care of your first $50 of that registration fee. So if you're interested in that, you can go there and sign up, or you can send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at Moving Iron Podcast.com, and I can answer any questions you might have. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour. We're Sean Hackett. It's going to be smart, folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hard work.